Good morning, church. Okay, now I can go on. Now I feel welcome. We are in a series called The Story for those visiting. And, um, and just to say, we're going through the stories from the first page of the Bible to the last pages. And so we're learning the stories of the Bible because there's so much power in stories and it gives it context and it's easy to enter into the stories in our imaginations. And we are in the Gospels, and uh, we'll be really beginning in, um, well, we're going to be all over the place. might be easier this morning, except when I tell you. Tell you what, be opening to Matthew 5, because we're going to be looking at the opening of Jesus' sermon. And, uh, and by the way, just I forgot it was St. Patrick's Day until this morning, and Jill said, do you got a green shirt to wear? And I, I do have one. And, uh, and it's, you know, and, and I liked what she was saying about it, because in America it's about corned beef and hash and drinking green beer. And, and, it's, and I like that she reminded us that, in, and by the way, I did a whole term paper on St. Patrick, and an amazing, he was just a boy, and he was taken captive by these wild Irish and from England, and, uh, and he managed to escape, and in his journeys back, he had this profound spiritual experience of meeting God, coming into a deeper relationship with God, and then God spoke uh, to him in a dream, and he saw a man from Ireland that said, we appeal to you, holy servant boy, to come and walk among us. Can you imagine the very people that took you captive and enslaved you? You go back, and he brought the kingdom of God, which is what this morning's message is about, and transformed a nation. What an easy illustration to open up with. So we're going to, this sermon title is Your Kingdom Come. How many, where does that come from? Lord's Prayer. You ever thought about what you're praying? What's that mean when I say, Father, your kingdom come? I don't know, but it's what we're supposed to say. Pray. Well, let's uh, explore that a little bit this morning. Let me pray. So, Father in heaven, you sent your son, born a king. But as an infant, and he rose in power, but not as we expected. So help us enter into the, the, the teachings and the parables of you, Jesus, and, and the things you did, the acts of God in the lives of ordinary men and women. And let us understand this a little bit because. It is of key importance that we know why you came and what you're inviting us into, which is the kingdom of God. And help me speak of these things that are beyond any person to speak or be worthy of teaching. And when we pray, all our hearts, God, will be humbled. This is, we're not here to do church. We're here to come in, the pre, in your presence by the Holy Spirit and have an encounter with you so we are not the same. This time on earth is so temporary and heaven is for eternity. So help us enter into it this morning now. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. So, in the outline, first point is kingdom proximity. And, and so in Matthew, there's so many cool things in the scriptures um, to speak on, but narrowing it down. Jesus, Jill talked last week about Jesus' baptism and what that was about and many other things in the story of Jesus' coming and that his temptation in the wilderness, the 40 days of battling the temptations of Satan. And as he comes out of the wilderness, the first thing we read is from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, there's this idea that there's a kingdom proximity. Kingdom proximity meaning how often do we hear in Jesus' words, you know, that the kingdom is near. Matter of fact, we read, uh, well, actually, in what I just read in Matthew 4.17, I like the NIV, it says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So, you, you, they're like, okay, yeah, we've been, we've been reading about kings in, in the Old Testament, and there's a few good ones and a, a lot of not so much kings. And, uh, and, and just to say, one of the things that marked David de- different as a king compared to King uh, Solomon is that Solomon was a monarch. He was a human. In, in America, we don't have a monoc- uh, uh, monarchy. <laughs> and, uh, but you just watch The Crown. You'll get a sense for it, and, uh, which Jill and I are doing because she's from England. It's fun to kind of capture that stuff. But Saul was not a king that would listen to God. That's why it was a monarchy. David was different. He was a theocratic king because he would listen for what God would speak and lead him into. He would do the will of God. So he, in that sense, wasn't a monarch just doing, I'm going to do what I think is best. He would, he would, not perfectly, obviously, but he would seek to hear from God. And that's All the Old Testament was prophesying leading up to ultimately God sending His Messiah, the anointed one of the Spirit, to become a king in the line of David. That kind of king. And obviously, who is it? Jesus. So simple you're afraid to say it like I'm going to trick you. I'm not. And so are you near the kingdom of God? Or are you in it? Luke 17, verse 20 through 21, we read, But being asked by the Pharisees, Jesus being asked, when the kingdom of God would come, and this is like late in his ministry, later in his ministry now, because it's like he keeps talking about this kingdom. And it's like, and he keeps talking about it being near, you know, and this idea of proximity. And he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. People were bumping right up to the kingdom, but not entering in. And it is so easy for us to do that. You know, you can grow up in Sunday school. You can be in the age group, you can be here on Sundays and keep hearing about the teachings and not enter into it. But you love the worship. You love the community. So you keep coming back for that part. That's all good. I'm glad you're here. Don't go away. But there's so much more right in front of you. That's why the big idea this morning is Many will come near the kingdom of God, but few will find the secret and enter in. Why is that? Because the kingdom is not a place, as Jesus was saying. It's spiritual, first of all. But the kingdom is not a place, but a relationship with Jesus. The kingdom is not a place, but it's the presence of God. And that's why it can be everywhere at once. So, kingdom's not a place but a person. Hold on to that. Do you want in? Wow, that's an enthusiastic response. Do you want in? (laughs) Well, wait until I'm done. You may change your mind. All right. I want to look at, now turn to Matthew 5. <clears throat> if you haven't got there, to your phones, swipe on over. We're going to be looking at verses 2 through 11. Jesus came teaching, and these are the, some of the fir- first words he taught. And, uh, and so this next second point is kingdom 
happiness. Now, how many of you want the happy life? Just a few. Most of you like misery. Is that? <laughs> Our Declaration of an Independence says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the... Ah, now I got you. Yeah, pursuit of happiness. And... And so, let me read, let's read the verses, and it's going to use the word blessed, and some tr translate it happy. It's a tough word, it's, uh, and, and so I want to dig into that a little bit, because blessed is so religious that we know it, we read it, it's all over the Bible, um, but it's like, what does that mean? And so sometimes it also can be translated happy. But I want to dig into this a little bit. Because this is the opening point of the kingdom. It's a blessed place to live. It's a happy place. But in America, we got to define happy because that is a word filled with emotion and based upon how things are going. So let's just read our verses this morning. And Jesus opened his mouth, verse 2, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you for and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And I, I want to read verse 12. I forgot to put that in the notes. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Does that sound happy? Poor, mourning, meek, hunger, hungry, merciful, pure, in heart, peacemakers persecuted. Still one in? <laughs> okay, got one. Like I said, the problem with the pursuit of happiness in America is it hangs on emotions which rise and fall with getting what we want. Happy one day, not happy the next. Sometimes you can't even wake up and nothing's happened and you're not happy. Advertisement tells us how to acquire happiness. Celebrities, athletes, and CEOs show us the way to live our lives to be happy, right? Come on, right? Yeah, Christianity, more than any other religion, it is, this is what makes Christianity distinctive, is that it is anchored in this world called, word called blessing. The very first pages wake up or open with God blessing us. The first, page, the first people we encounter, Abraham and Sarah, are called to be blessers of nations. Blessing, happiness, is, is a word that is all over the Old and New Testament in a way that no other religion has its identity in blessing. Right? So Christians are meant to be the most blessed, happiest people on the planet. You ever heard that song, Happy is a Yuppie Word? By Switchfoot? You guys got to listen to something other than Christian radio. 
By the way, they are Christians, so you won't go to hell for listening to them. They got this, they got this chorus, it's, and it's John Foreman. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Um, and he sings, happy is a yuppie word. Nothing, oh, by the way, yuppie. That's young urban professionals. Well, urban is the more common. I understand upward because you're moving upward. But John, I was a yuppie. I should know. I lived in Silicon Valley making big money as an engineer, driving a sports car, living the good life. So, this, uh, so his words, happy is a yuppie word. Nothing in the world could fail me now. It's empty as an argument. I'm running down a life that won't cash out. I love that because he starts off saying there's this thing called happiness and it's, it's not worth having, that there's nothing, he has something in his life, in this world, that will never fail him. He's saying, it's a, what that world offers is an empty argument, and he's living a life that won't come to nothing. He won't cash out, it won't come to an end, it's still reaping profit. Good, huh? He was inspired, and this was in the Rolling Stone magazine, um, another non-Christian um, thing. He was, he, he was inspired uh, by Bob Dylan's words in 1991. Bob Dylan was being interviewed, and listen to this. Bob Dylan, you know Bob Dylan? I'm not sure if he ever gets outside of here. Uh, I need to leave some food and water for you guys. Um. Bob Dylan said, these are yuppie words uh, when they were asking about, oh, they asked him, are you happy? And, he, and you know, Bob, man, he's like, these are yuppie words. Happiness and unhappiness, he replied. It's not happiness or unhappiness. It's either blessed or unblessed. Hmm. Cool, huh? So John Foreman, also in the song, says, I'm looking for the kingdom coming down. He found something. And uh, that won't cash out. And so, um, and so this is what Jesus is trying to offer us is a happiness that is true happiness. That's why, that's why in your outline I said truly happy are. Because just saying happy makes us confused. And this is important of what you can have but offer other people. When you're offering Jesus... You're offering a happiness they don't have. And in uh, Tim Mackey, the Bible project, struggling to how to interpret that and beyond one word, he says, it could be trans- blessed, it could be translated, the good life belongs to. Right? All right. Got a handle on that? Nine times Jesus is speaking his desire, desire for us to be blessed. Eight times times he's revealing the conditions in which we experience true happiness. These are eight ways that we can pursue happiness. They don't just come upon them, but we can uh, pursue them like we have our, the rights to do in America, right? And, uh, but they're, each one, notice as we read it, is anchored in relationship and it's conditional. It's different than the happiness the world's telling us about. And so in your outline, I've spent a couple hours <laughs> in trying to put some fresh words to what it means, these, these eight blessings. Because we know them, we, so often we read them if we've been raised in church, but we don't really get it. And so for nothing else, grab the outline just so it makes me feel I didn't waste my time. I just felt compelled to do this, actually for my sake. Actually, I was thinking this may not be the best hours to use in writing a sermon. It's like, I want them. I want to be able to read these, pray them. They're conditional. i got to figure out which ones I have and which ones I don't. How about you? You still in? Truly happy are the poor in spirit. For theirs 
is the kingdom of heaven. By the way, these are key, this, happiness is a kingdom thing. I didn't mention this, but the first one and the last one, poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ha, um, truly happy are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're bookends. This is kingdom stuff I'm talking that Jesus is preaching. So the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are bankrupt of pride, there is more room for God's spirit and his rule in our life. Got to get the pride out to get more spirit in. Truly happy, the second one, are those who mourn. When we grieve our losses and our sin, we find ourselves embraced by God's love and forgiveness. Truly happy are the meek. When we don't take by force what we want in this world, but use our power to benefit others, we find ourselves rightful owners of what really matters. I want to pause for a moment on that one. Meekness is right use of power. Jesus was insanely meek, but unimaginably powerful. And that's hard for us in America. We think, ah, meek. No, I got to show people I'm strong. And when I was in, in working in electronics, man, there was courses on assertiveness training. We'd go off to learn how to be more assertive, intimidating, right? You ever heard of Napoleon Bonaparte? The uh, French, uh, he was uh, led a French revolution and then became emperor in the, from 1804 to uh, 1814. And uh, Donald Miller, uh, in his book, uh, oh, I just went blank on his book, Searching for What God, uh, Searching for God Knows What, uh, quotes him and, and listen to, this is, this is what this conqueror, this ruler, this king is saying. He says, quote, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between, between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. What's he talking about? He goes on. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Go live your life meekly. You'll get a bigger following. All right, four. Truly happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we reject the empty relationships of the world and to... Um, let me start again. When we reject the empty relationships of the world and do what's right righteousness, which is a relational word. You can obey the law, keep the speed limit. That's no relationship in it directly. But all the things that are called righteousness are anchored in relationship. So do what's right. We find deep relationships with God and others. Truly happy are the merciful. When we offer compassion and forgiveness instead of anger, we find ourselves recipients of the same. Truly happy are the pure in heart. When we love others from a selfless heart, we find ourselves looking into the face of God. You see God. Jesus taught on that. He talked about those that thirst, those that are homeless, those in prison. And said, as you did to any one of these, you have done so to me. You want to see the face of God? Find a pure heart. Seven, the peacemakers. Truly happy are the peacemakers. When we work for peace and camaraderie, and camaraderie is one of, one of my favorite words. It has to do with this mutual trust and friendship among people who spend time together in common activities or ventures. 
I wanted, and so let me read this and say something about when we work for peace and camaraderie, instead of taking offense and vilifying others, we truly take on the likeness of our Father in heaven. Listen up, believers. We are living in a world where people are turning, you know, speaking and, and attacking the character of others. That's vilifying. Turn them, turning them into monsters. We're living in a culture where we're taking offense at everything. Matter of fact, I'm coming across people, even religious leaders, who are wanting to be offended. So they feel like they belong to this group that's offended. And if, I can, if you don't offend me, you know what I'll do? I'll take on offense of someone else you offended, and I'll be offended because you offended them. And so now I'm offended at them, at you through them, and it gets all messy. Right? Are we not living in a time where everyone is offended? You didn't say anything. I'm feeling offended. <laughs> Instead, work, not just hope for it, work for peace and camaraderie. Bring people together. I'm doing that uh, among pastors in Dane County right now. I'm working to create a retreat for pastoral couples from all different streams of God's kingdom in the next fall. And I've even with help managed to get it, get it to be free. Five-day retreat. And we're coming from different ethnic backgrounds and, and uh, religious streams. So this stuff matters. This is Christ, right? There's already 15 couples this far in advance signed up, come and pray for more. Um, eight, truly happy are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When people attack us because we refuse to conform to their culture and share the truth and love of Jesus Christ, then great is our reward in heaven. And that last one takes us to we are not living for happiness in the moment, but for a happiness in the future, in a, in a relationship with God that goes on for eternity. Amen? So, Trust me on this, especially the young ones, young adults and teens, because I went after American happiness and got it, but discovered how fleeting it is. You know, I, for those of you who know me, you know, I grew up in California. I like sports cars. Um, I like girls, and I like money, and I went after all of it. But it's so fleeting because it's never enough, the kind of happiness the world offers. And then someone messed it up, and that was God. And, uh, and I, had, I was on my way. I was going to live in a cabin in the woods with my wife, away from people, and, uh, and, but drive into work, because, you know, some nowadays you can work from the house, you couldn't then. But, uh, and so God got a hold of my life because my life turned dark, and it, it's not satisfying. Trust me, don't pursue the th happiness the way the world's pursuing it. And then the other person that messed it up was Jill. Because I thought, well, I'll get married, live in the Santa Cruz foothills with my wife. We'll drive in for work and drive in the church. But she wanted community. And I appreciate both God and her very much because that's where I'm experiencing true happiness. Third point, kingdom teaching. Um, I'm going to, in these I want to go through quickly, more like a melody, but we've been reading, and by the way, if you're new, um, grab, and you want to join in, there's these books in the back called The Story, it's literally the scriptures, the story scriptures, and, uh, and so we've been reading so many things of Jesus teaching this week, and also of his power and authority, and we have life groups, you can still jump in, you don't have to have been in the ones for seating, and so there's a Wednesday, Thursday life group. Um, you can find those online. And uh, and so Jesus teaching. I want to uh, look. Turn now to Luke, and in Luke chapter four, verse thirteen. No, 
that's not it, Luke 4, 43. All right. This is important concept in Jesus' teaching. But he said to them, because he had just done an amazing amount of casting out demons, healing everyone, and, uh, and crowds were coming by the droves. And, and, he, and he departed and went away to a desolate place in the Santa Cruz foothills. And, and his disciples found him out. And he, and he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. See, he didn't come to make us all better physically. Primarily, he came to teach the things that are eternal and lasting. But... In this teaching, um, I love, I love man. He, his teaching was ruffling the feathers of the religious establishment. Jesus spoke against superficial religious practices of the leaders that don't come from an honest heart. He talked about the hypocrisy of prayer. He redefined what true religion is, just like I was redefining what true happiness is. He said anger and lust in a heart is just as bad as actual murder and adultery. He taught to love one's enemy, pray for them, and bless them. He, he warned against judgmental attitudes. He pressed us to uh, give to the needy. <coughs> He pressed us to give to the needy. He warned against the dangers of materialism. He refocused people with anxiety disorders onto his Father in heaven who cares for them. These are just samples of the teaching of Jesus. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Fourth point, kingdom power and authority. Luke 4.36. He just healed a man with an unclean demon. And he was teaching with this authority. And we read in verse 36, And they were amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For, I like, I have just my mind word, word. In Jesus, we learned on John 1, is the word. It's not a thing. It's again, a person. Like heaven is not a place, but a person. What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. And then look, turn over to 619. And the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. That's authority and power. He had, so Jesus was able to command a lost man with a legion of demons and he cast out the demons that went into a pig and the pigs ran off a cliff. His power healed a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years and mistreated by quacks, we'll say that. Um, Jesus' authority, with authority, Jesus took the hand of a father's dead child and said, little girl, I say to you, get up. Jesus healed two blind men who had faith for healing. Jesus healed lepers. Jesus healed cripples. Jesus had the authority to command the wind and the waves to obey him. Do you get it? He had a lot of power and authority. He had amazing teaching. You still want in? No? I get less yeses this time. But wouldn't that be great? To be in that kind of kingdom? Fifth, the reason I keep asking do you want in is because 
in Luke chapter 8, we read about the parable of the soils or parable of the sower, depending on the heading um, your Bible gives it. And in this parable, I want you, there, we, we read many parables this week. In our life group this week, we asked, what's your favorite parable? It's fun to talk about our favorites. And we all had different favorite ones, and that's cool. But one thing we all have to trust is that the parable of the sower is the most important one because it is first. Out of all the parables Jesus could teach from all, all the synoptic gospels, have him, that's the first parable you will read because it holds the secret to bearing fruit. Jesus um, is comparing the kingdom of heaven in a parable to common things we experience. He wants us to understand something that's so spiritual it may be hard to grasp. So he brings us teaching down to things we can understand like um, like farming and fishing, you know, and stuff like that, right? And he's using uh, stories, parables that are common to the culture around him. Eugene Peterson says, a parable is Jesus' way of saying something that re requires imaginative participation of the listener. The word parable literally means something down alongside of. So I like that because the power of a parable is in you. Meaning, you have the choice to make it powerful in your life. Otherwise, it's just an interesting little analogy. And so, when you say something down alongside of, that's like Jesus saying a story and you're going, hey, what's this doing here? What's this mean? And it makes you pause a parable instead of just Jesus declaring platitudes, which he could have. But he keeps telling parables because you're going, I'm not sure I get it. And he's going, well, go meditate on it, you know? And so you've got to pause and you've got to meditate and you've got to pray and, and, and try to understand these things. And so this parable is important because it's not, is, is it only the first, because it holds the key to a person's understanding of how to enter the kingdom of God. And there's four different reactions to hearing the word of God. There's the hard heart, the shallow heart, the crowded heart, and the fruitful heart. And so let's read um, in Luke 8 the parable and how Jesus interprets it. All right? Still with me? Want to know how to get in? And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town to town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower, that's someone that scatter seeds, because we're not so much an agricultural society. Um, a sower went out to sow a seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and it grew up. It withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell in good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Meaning ears that are connected to a heart that wants to receive it. And when his, verse 9, And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. And what he's saying about this is parable seed, seeds create a, a division, par or parables. It, it, it defines 
who's wanting to believe and those who have unbelief. It's, it's making a distinction between those who want in good faith and a humble heart to receive the teachings of the Lord and those that don't. And so he was speaking these things. But let me, um, let me just read for you quickly from Mark uh, 4 that also all synoptics have the same parable. And, and in this... Jesus, Mark gives us a little bit more when they asked him to help understand. And, and Jesus said in Mark 4, 13, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? You can't understand this one. If you can't understand this one, you'll never understand the others. Why is that? The secret was they were with Jesus. They were in his presence, and the one that has the truth, the one, the word of God, can explain these things we cannot understand. Make sense? And so these are disciples, and he had more than just the 12, but these are the ones that came to understand because he explains it to them. And he says, starting verse 11, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The, one, the ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And so you have this hard soil, and it's... Uh, and, and actually, there is a difference between soil and dirt. Smithsonian did a huge project on this. Soil is rich with life, ready to receive a seed and have it sprout and grow. Dirt has none of the billions of organisms that live in, in soil, and nothing can grow on it. And so this is soil that's just been trampled on into hard dust, and nothing will ever grow. And Satan comes along because that heart is so hard, they won't receive anything Jesus is saying, and he takes it away. 13, and the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. I've seen this. Jill and I um, went with her family to Yugoslavia many, many years ago, and, uh, which doesn't exist now, does it? Am I dating myself? I've lived longer than countries. Um, and in near the ocean, any soil, anywhere where there was soil, could not, things could not be built on it. And in a tour, and, and he pointed that out, and he says, now you notice, you know, all the houses are in the foothills because it's all rock and nothing will grow there. There was too much rock for there to have, for anything to take root. 14, and as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked <coughs> by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who hearing the word, three things, hearing the word, holding it fast and honest and good heart, bear fruit with patience. Because even for the believer, life's hard, and you get some good seeds, word of God in your heart, but things can get really tough. But you persevere with it. Don't let go of it. Don't disbelieve it. It came from Jesus, and there will be growth. Amen? So when you look, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at these four conditions of the heart, it's only the last rich soil that describes is described as a as a good and honest heart because it listens. We learned this in the Old Testament. The word listen is used a lot. In the Old Testament Hebrew, the word listen is also translated obey, meaning 
that you're only really listening when in your heart you have the intent to obey what you hear. There's lots of people hearing, but not so many listeners. And and so what I want you to note is Jesus taught this, the four soils, there's progressively more soil. You go from no soil to a little soil, but not enough because of all the rocks piled in it, to a little more soil, but it's competing with other things that are growing in it called weeds. And, and these are, you know, the pleasures of life. You know, it's, it's uh, the, the others, you, he expands on it, the cares of the world. Cares of the world are our energies that we put into things that we have most of our attention, but they choke off the life because there's just not a time, enough time for God in church, right? Or your time in reading the Word. There's the deceitful, deceitfulness of riches. And so instead of pursuing the riches of the kingdom, which are in relationships, we pursue personal riches that are really temporary. And then there's also the pleasures of life. We seek, and this is so much so now, man, we, when we get beat up or life's hard and we get sad, of course, it's natural to want to pursue the pleasures of life. And it feels good, but these pleasures soon take over for us. So all these compete for the time and energies that leave no time for God. So that's why we want the good rich soil, because it produces what? Fruit. In, in, this, in this Jewish culture, it could be the wheat and grains, it could be the grapes, it could be the uh, fig trees. All these things have one thing in common. Their purpose for existence is bearing fruit. And so is yours. God wants you to have a fruitful life. Amen? And he says that a hundredfold. Do you know in, in this culture, a normal fold would be 12%, 12-fold? 15 would be, whoa, that almost never happens. But with the Word of God in a good heart, it's 100% fold. That's amazing. Dig deeper. Persevere with it until something breaks through that hardness. And, And so, I don't want you listening to this as, oh, we're talking about those that aren't Christians and those that are. I have found in my heart, it was the hard heart, had no place, no care, but I've also found it go, and then I got good soil, and I started growing. But you will, like me, find that there's times you're, the soil in your heart's not so rich and deep. It's got a little, little competing with it, right? And one of our uh, leaders, um, even though she didn't care if I uh, gave her name, I'm not going to. But she uh, was re- telling some of us how she's reading this was reading this super long novel, a fictional novel, 1,500 pages, and felt she should, and she used the word, we haven't even got to this this morning yet, she used the word intertwined. That's what, that's what weeds do. They intertwine with the other roots and mess it up. And, it, and she doesn't feel it was wrong to read a fictional novel. She just felt it was taking her focus away from the Lord, from doing the things He wanted her to do. And she was remembering Paul's teachings in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, Paul says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I find that in my own life, that the weed one. I kind of go get back into the weeds are growing. And it could be things like exercise. I mean, I love outdoor activities and exercising in the club. And I found that to avoid the crowds, I was going in the mornings. First thing I do, wake up and go to the health club and work out all morning. But I found that then I was not so much time with God. And I had to make a choice. See, this is the thing. It's conditional. And it's like, I will not exercise until I've had my time with the Lord, reading and praying. There's consequences sometimes to making these choices, right? 
but I'm going after the eternal stuff. How about you? So then we come to the last point, six, kingdom prayer. And there is the Lord's Prayer. Say the first part with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your, on. Awesome. That's the upper story. That's an upper story prayer saying what's, what your kingdom is, I want to come. And so what I'd like to do is close with a responsive reading of the Beatitudes. And, and this is where we begin, and this is where I want to end. And so are you in? You still in? We'll read this um, as a response. I'll read the leader part. You read the response, and then I'll pray for us. Sound good? Please stand. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You may be seated. I invite the worship team to come up, and I'm going to pray for us. And so I encourage you, take this. Take these Beatitudes. Take either this week, focus on the Beatitudes and ask yourself, Which ones encourage my heart? Which ones am I experiencing? But also then ask yourself, which one challenges me and I'm not very happy about and I want more of that blessing? Or take the soils and ask yourself, which is the condition of my heart right now? What's the soil condition? And what do I need to make it deeper and richer, right? Don't listen to another podcast or read another book, we fill up our lives with, we are the most informed, knowledgeable people that the planet has seen in hundreds of years combined in each one of us. And Satan is a great intellect. What? If he could keep us just learning, 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 and never applying, 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 he's got us in a really good place. So I encourage you, listen to one less podcast. Put the book down one night. Turn off Netflix one night. You'll do your soul such richness. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, I bring these beautiful ones before you that you love so much. And I pray for all of us, God, me too. I want to be in. I want to be in your kingdom. And when we pray, Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your, your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These aren't just words. It's, it's a proclamation saying, God, we want in your kingdom. Jesus, we're praying with you to your Father. We want to participate in this. We want to be those that bring the teaching of the word. We want to bring the power and the authority of the kingdom into the life of another who has no life. Forgive us. We begin where we started. We repent, Jesus. Because we don't want to just be in proximity to the kingdom. We want to be in the heart of it. Forgive us when we've let so many things steal our attention away. Forgive us for pursuing empty happiness. And I'm praying for those here, Jesus. Would you pour your blessings upon them as they open up their hearts to you in a fresh way this week, in a fresh way for the rest of their lives. Let us take on 
the Beatitudes because they are reflections of your character in heaven. This is what the world needs. But when our character is right with you, our life is right with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for coming as King. And we surrender our hearts and call you sovereign and honored to serve you. And we anxiously wait for your return. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.